Everybody love the New England Patriots? <laughs> it's a group we don't, I guess we love to hate. Why would the New England Patriots risk it all? Huge risk to go and film other teams' practices. To the point they're still called cheaters to this day. More than that, more than that, Astros, Houston Astros. So they took this incredible effort to steal team signs to play baseball. And they're still getting beamed for it today. Why do we invest huge money? We, we, we set up whole agencies to spy on other nations. Even friendly nations spy on each other, believe it or not. And then it's not just nations. Pharmaceutical companies spy on other pharmaceutical companies. Tech companies spy on tech companies. Why? Why do we put such this huge investment in espionage? Why? Because information is power. Information. Just a little bit of information can change everything. And it changes <laughs> a plan. It enables you now to put together a plan that has a greater chance of actually succeeding out in what the world is really like. Information is power. And that's where we're going to be today. We're in 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 18. And what we're talking about is a resurgence. We as Christians, as we look out on our nation we're getting more and more discouraged because we see our nation devolving rather than evolving. It's becoming less Christian. It's more divided, is it not? There, there's, there's less respect one for another. There's less tolerance. There's, there's less peace out there. And on top of it, there is this kind of push, this cultural push to silence Christianity and keep us out of the discussion. And we want to see a resurgence in our land. And that's why we've been talking about Elijah and Elisha and the resurgence that they led. Because we're hoping that we can learn from it so that we can be a part of being that people that pushes back, that is countercultural, that is out there being salt and light and is helping us be a force for good in our land, in our nation. And so today we're going to see Elijah as this architect of the resurgence being smart. He, he understands the lay of the land so he can, using the information he has, put together a plan that actually works. So if you have your Bibles, we're in 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. And we're going to pick it up right at verse 1. So let, let me kind of set the stage so you understand where we are in the story. Elijah is just come on the scene. He just, he just seems to just, bam, be there. He shows up in just the, the chapter before, and suddenly he's standing before, before the king, and the name of the king is a guy is Ahab. He is the king of Israel, the northern part of the nation, and his capital is Samaria, and him and his wife, his wife's name is Jezebel, they're leading the people of God away from God. They're leading people to abandon the God, the God that made huge promises to Abraham, the God who, who rescued them out of Egypt, not only miraculously rescued them out of Egypt, out of the hands of the Egyptian, but then established them in the very land that they lived in. And these people, Ahab and Jezebel, are pushing, they're pushing the culture away from God. And Elijah just just appears on the scene and he leads this resurgence back for the things of God. And what he does is he challenges the God of Ahab, the God of Jezebel, to a duel, to a fight, to, to, to a contest. And it's a contest that involves around rain because the God of Jezebel and the God of Ahab is the God of storms. His name is Baal. And he's the God of storms, so he's the God of rain. And because he's the God of rain there in that semi-arid environment, he's the God of life because everything flows from rain. And they really believe that if they shift over to Baal, they shift their allegiances, Baal will take better care of them than Yahweh did. Because he's the God of rain, and that's what we really need. The problem underneath it at all is Baal, does, Baal doesn't even exist. He's not real. He's just a PR campaign. 
He can't offer anything. And so Elijah stands before the king. He comes to the court and he says, it's on. And I challenge you to a fight. He says, as far as the Lord God of Israel lives, who I serve, there will be no rain or dew for years until I say otherwise. And so for three and a half years, there's been this drought in the land, proving that Baal has no power. His superpower is nothing. God has shut down the rain. He's made the skies like iron and the ground like bronze. Farming has just ceased. I mean, it's the economy is devastated. Three and a half years of drought. Farmers are sitting around twiddling their thumbs. They have nothing to do. And they're just trying to eke out some sort of existence for their family. And people are suffering. And that's where we pick it up today. So we're, we're in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1. He says, after a long time, three and a half years long. And imagine how long it felt. Imagine three and a half years of drought, of just eking out in existence, how long it felt. After a long time, in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, and he says, go and present yourself to Ahab, that king, and I will send rain on the land. It's time for the rain to come again. And so Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. So he takes that trip he's been hiding in Sidon with that widow, and he takes the trip back to Israel, and it says this, now the famine was severe in Samaria. That's the capital of Israel, and it's been really tough on everyone. And Ahab had summoned Obadiah, and, and that's not the Obadiah you may be thinking of. Obadiah was a common Bible name. It's not the guy that wrote the book Obadiah, but it's another Obadiah. This Obadiah is his palace administrator. He handles all the logistics for his palace. And Obadiah, so like an inside story here, Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. He's, he's one faithful to Yahweh. While at the same time he's faithful in the palace, Jezebel, the queen, was killing off the Lord's prophets. So while God was proving himself, every time it didn't rain, Yahweh was showing his dominance and power and that he was the true God, the one true God. There was still this Jezebel, the queen, the, the one who came to push Baal on this culture She's systematically silencing everyone who spoke out for God. So you might think, hey, this is God proving himself. And so prophets would come forward and say, hey, God is proving how powerful he is over Baal. So while Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, 50 in each, and had supplied them with food and water, which is quite the undertaking in the midst of a three and a half year drought to feed a hundred people water and food. But you have Jezebel systematically killing, let's think of them as pastors, systematically getting rid of pastors that promoted Yahweh promoted the one true God. It was okay if you were quiet about your faith. It was okay if you were subdued. But as, long, as soon as you spoke up and you had the audacity to defy Jezebel and Ahab like Elijah did, she would hunt you down and she would kill you. She had her prophet hunters and she would kill you. And it was so desperate, so bad, that Obadiah had to hide a hundred he could rescue in caves. And notice how Ahab's handling this three and a half years. Ahab had said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have to kill any of the animals. So this is the king. And, and things have gotten so bad, it's like, let's just scour the land. Let, let's just go. You go that direction, I'll go this direction, and maybe you'll find something green. And if you find anything green and anything growing, cut it down and bring it. For what? For horses and mules. This is the king of the land. And he's not collecting grass and green things for his people. He's not, notice he's not worried and burdened about the people he's responsible for in the land 
He's worried about his own mule, his mules and his horses. Get a picture of what Jezebel and Ahab are like. This is a selfish, a selfish ruling class that it is all about them. I believe they want to throw off Yahweh. They want to throw off the constraints of Yahweh because they want to do what they want to do. In the book of Judges, we're told that people want to do what's right in their own eyes. And that's the God of self. That's this God of selfishness where we just want to live the way we want to live and we want to throw off the way God would hinder us and hold us back. And I believe a lot of idolatry, whether it's Baal (laughs) or whether it's consumerism, materialism, power, or fame, I believe it's all basically to get what we want to get. And at the heart of it, it's all about self. And so anybody that doesn't say something that Jezebel likes, that doesn't fit her agenda, you need to be canceled. You need to be stopped. You need to be shut down. In fact, your life doesn't matter. It it needs to cease Because what I want is more important than your very life. And then Ahab, the same way, is like, I I don't care about the people. I don't care about the widows and the orphans out there. All I care about is the horses and mules in my own barns. These guys are horrible, evil people. In fact, when God summed up Ahab, he said he did more evil than all the kings before him. He's a terrible king. Because he's a selfish king. When you talk about resurgence, there's always this force. This force, and I'm going to call them, for a lack of better terms, this entrenched opposition. This is the people. These are the, the aggressive atheists out there. These are the people that despise Christianity in our day and are pushing back on it. Some people would say it's racist. Some people would say it's intolerant. Some people say it's misogynist, it's anti-woman, that that it's just anti-freedom, that it's archaic, that, that, that it's just this intolerant thing that's got to be shut down. And they want something else. The big push right now is socialism. Socialism is diametrically opposed to faith, Christianity faith. It is is absolutely inconsistent with scripture. But yet they want it. They want this redistribution of wealth. God believes in property rights, right? Do not steal. He believes in property rights. And he has established an economy that is a capitalistic one, but it's a generous capitalistic one. Not a crony capitalism, but this generous capitalism that flows from real faith. So it was meant to be, yes, go out there and do what you can do. Sell what you can sell. You achieve personally what you can achieve, but share. Share. Out of the abundance God gives you, share with the poor. Socialism says you don't get to own. The government gets to own, and we get to distribute it equally. God is opposed to that. And there are huge forces right now pushing a counter faith to ours. Socialism all over the world has failed and has often pushed a government religion and violence And millions and millions of people have died because they vocalized any kind of resistance to socialism. It's got a bad track record and it does not fit with scripture. There are people there, there are people in all these other movements that want this selfish agenda for themselves. They want power, they want fame, They want just stuff. And they're entrenched. They want their way. And they're there in every culture. In every culture we ever live in, there will be this people, this group of people that tries to pull the populace, the people, the masses away from God into something new. And they will create this PR campaign to paint it up as something better. 
which is what Baal is all about, right? Jezebel and Ahab have created this PR campaign for a God that doesn't even exist. The emperor has no clothes whatsoever. He has no power. He can't control the rain. And that's what's been proven for three and a half years. And yet these two individuals, these entrenched opposition, act like their God is still God. Even though God has proven his power over them, they act like nothing's changed. They are thick. This is what Elijah knows. Elijah knows that there's this group that needs to be defied, that needs to be stood up against, needs to be confronted and say, this is not the way. And you have to go right at them and oppose them because they are out there pushing the other way, pushing and pulling people away from God. And the problem is, these, this is a group that typically can't be reached because they live in a bubble, a reaffirming bubble that speaks the same talk, that confirms each other's thinking and, and says, yes, this is the way to go. This is the right way. We need to leave Christianity. We need to leave this thing. That's right. It's been bad. So they're hard to reach because they live in a bubble, but also because they're so entrenched in it. They, they, their life is based in this. Their, their careers are based in it. They've put everything into this, and Elijah confronts these people. And I think we need to get brave enough to confront them as well. But that leads to the second group that's out there. As Obadiah, and he's part of the second group I want you to see. As Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. So God sent Elijah, Obadiah's out scouring for anything green, and Elijah meets Obadiah. Obadiah recognizes him, and notice how Obadiah responds. He bowed down to the ground and said, is it really you, my Lord? And that's L-O-R-D, small case, meaning it's not Yahweh. This is now master. Is it really you, my Lord, Elijah? Yes, he replied. Go and tell your master Elijah is here. Now, this is going to freak Obadiah out. He gets really nervous about this. So so he says, what what, what have I done wrong? Asked Obadiah that you are handing your servant. Notice he calls himself a servant now. First it was Lord, now it's servant. Over to Ahab to be put to death. What did I do to you (laughs) that you would endanger me in this way? As surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. Now we get a glimpse into those three and a half years. Ahab has sent sent emissaries all all over the place to every nation nearby. And those emissaries have not been polite. And whenever a nation or kingdom claimed you were not there, he would make them swear they could not find you. So he put diplomacy at risk and pushed. Ahab has been hunting you for three and a half years. And it's not a casual hunt. You were the most wanted man in the kingdom why because what do you do with people that speak up for God in this culture a culture that leaves God you silence them you cancel them and that's what they wanted to do with Elijah they are actually hoping that if they could kill Elijah the rain would come back because that's how magic tends to work and that's how they're thinking And whenever a nation or kingdom claimed you were not there, he made them swear that they could not find you. But now, now you show up and tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here? That's crazy. I don't know where the spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave. In other words, I don't know where you've been. It's like the Spirit of the Lord has just carried you off to some mountaintop or something. Nobody could find you and he he could do that again. When I leave you, if I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. The whole picture is Obadiah feels like he's hanging on by a thread. Obadiah represents a a, a different group of people, what I call silent believers. Notice, and he's going to defend himself. He says, yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. I've been a believer. I've been a true believer of Yahweh. Haven't you heard, my Lord, of what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 in each, and supplied them with food and water. And now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here? He 
will kill me. What is he saying? This is what happens when the culture drifts from God. There becomes this other population of what I call silent believers. And I believe teachers are in this category. At least the teachers that don't work in Christian private schools. These are the people where policies and structures have been put in place. And you're no longer allowed to talk about Jesus. I've lived in our land long enough to see prayer and God talk taken out of schools because when I was a kid it was allowed but it is no longer allowed systematically the culture is being shifted and pulled by these entrenched opposition against the things of God and now because of it there's this whole population of believers that have been silenced out there and one of them are the professional teachers because the policies have been put on them that they're not allowed to share their faith unless they're asked. And even then, it's still frowned on. And it's not just teachers. It's businessmen, businesswomen. If they're too out there with their faith, what happens? Their whole business can be shut down. They can, they be, they can be canceled themselves. The whole culture can boycott them because, because they're too old school or they're for traditional family or whatever it is. The culture slams down on them and tries to ruin them, tries to marginalize them, and tries to shut them down. That is reality in our culture today. And so what happens is there's people like Obadiah out there. He's in his job. And he's a real serious believer in Yahweh, but yet he doesn't say anything. Why? He lives with Jezebel. He works in her palace. He works in Ahab's palace. And the only reason he's alive and the only reason why he still has his job is he's exceptional at it. How do you keep a hundred prophets alive in caves? Give them enough food and water for three and a half years in the middle of a drought. It's because you're good at your job. But you not only have Obadiah, who's quiet in his faith, but yet living in his faith silently and secretly, so he's not killed for it. But you have a hundred prophets hiding. And it's not just this. We're going to find next chapter that God is going to reveal to Elijah that he has 7,000 still who are faithful out there. I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. All whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. But they're silent. And the ones who spoke up, what happened to them? What happened to the ones that had the courage to speak up and say, this is enough. We're not going to be run over like this anymore. We're going to speak up for the things of God. We're going to promote God. We're going to promote the ways of God. What happened to them? They were killed. Jezebel hunted them down. This is serious stuff, guys. There's a cultural war that is taking place and has always been taking place. Always. The world is opposed to God and pulling the world from God, pulling the people from God. While God is in the world and the spirit of God and the people of God are trying to pull the people towards him. And it's a constant struggle for attention and who's got voice. And people's lives depend on it. People need God. People need life. People need to be restored to God and have eternal life. And not only that, our culture needs God in it. Our culture's better with God. And yet, what the culture does is it tries to silence us. And so we'll post about everything but our faith. We'll post about meals and vacations. But we're very reluctant. I I find myself, I get out of there, I find myself hesitating to post anything about God. There's this second thought. There's this second guessing. There's this thing. There's this thing that happens. It's this pressure the culture has created to keep us silent. And we need to push through it. We need to reestablish the ways of God in our land. It's interesting 
that in this passage, though, Elijah and the writer never condemns Obadiah, never condemns the prophets for hiding, and never condemns the ones that spoke up and got killed for it, these, these silent ones. It's interesting that in this story, there's this kind of this understanding that they're doing what they can. They're praying. Obadiah is doing his faith secretly, but he's making a difference. At least in a hundred prophets' lives, he's making an impact. We need to realize that not everybody's an Elijah. We want to be Elijah's. We want to be that force. But some people just don't get traction. That's what happened for a lot of prophets, they didn't get traction. They were killed for speaking up. And then along comes Elijah, and he finds a foothold. He finds traction in a culture that we're surprised he's able to get traction in. And suddenly there's this voice. And it doesn't seem, it doesn't seem to matter what this entrenched opposition does. They can't seem to stop him. So let's look at that next one. Elijah said, as the Lord Almighty lives, that's his line, right? As the Lord Almighty, as Yahweh Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab. So basically he swears to Obadiah, hey, I'm not going anywhere. I'll be here. You don't have to worry about your life. I'm really going to meet with Ahab. He has to swear to it, but he does. So Obadiah finally trust that Elijah will be there when he comes back. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Now, this is huge. Do kings come and meet prophets, or do prophets come and meet kings? Does the mountain come to Muhammad, or do Muhammad go to the mountain? Typically, it's those in power, you come to them. This says a lot, that Ahab is willing to come to Elijah, versus Elijah going to Ahab. Elijah has all the power in this relationship right now. He's, he's got the drought, three and a half years. And so Ahab is willing to do anything to end this drought. And when he saw Elijah, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Isn't that amazing? That the real heartache in the land, the real trouble came from him and his wife. They are the ones that led the people away from God. They're the ones that led them away from life and led them towards the consequences that naturally come from living apart from God. You, cultures do not get better when they leave God. They get worse. They devolve. They get more tense. They get more divided. They get more violent. And that's exactly what we're seeing. And yet he has the nerve to say, Elijah, this is your fault. You troubler of Israel. And the idea is you're a selfish person that is causing the rest of Israel to suffer. Because that goes all the way back to Achan and the, the book of Joshua. Troubler of Israel. You selfish person that's making all of us suffer. Verse 18. Elijah stands right up to him. He's bold. He doesn't care. He doesn't care how many likes he gets on Facebook. He doesn't care how many followers he has on Instagram. He doesn't care. He says, I have not made trouble for Israel. Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and you have followed the Baals because it's a husband and wife duo, right? There's Baal and then there's his wife Asherah. And so together they're called the Baals. You have led us away from God, which means because we've left God, the culture is devolved and God's blessing is gone and our culture will continue to struggle and get worse until we come back to God. And that is on you. It's not on me. Have you noticed the culture blames Christianity for everything? Everything. For all of the wars of history, it's all caused by organized religion. It's not caused by the sinfulness of humanity. It's caused by faith. And that's exactly what he's doing. In the midst of it all, you have these groups, right? You have the entrenched opposition. You have the silent believers. But periodically, God gives us an Elijah. And I say God gives us Elijah because how do you explain Elijah? Hundreds of prophets tried to do what Elijah is doing now, and they died for it. But suddenly you get this guy who's able to get traction and, and seems to be safe from whatever they do. In fact, Obadiah's thinking the Spirit of God must just whisk you away because how did you live for three and a half years? How did you escape the manhunt? You wouldn't believe the manhunt. 
And yet you endured it all. You survived it all. We as believers need to be good to Elijah's. I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. Because what does it take to get a voice again? What does it take to really speak into the culture and move the culture towards God? Because many try. And they're just silenced. But when a voice comes forward and it finally finds, finds traction, I've decided, you know, if they're able to find traction, even if I don't totally believe with everything they're saying, meaning if I look at my doctrine and, and we have six out of ten together, they believe in Jesus and they're promoting Jesus and they're believing in true faith and they're believing in the kingdom of God, even if we don't agree on baptism and the Lord's Supper, I'm going to support them. I've been thinking about Kanye lately. Kanye's finding traction in our culture. I don't know why. I don't know why his voice matters, why he's able to throw worship services just on the spur and get these massive crowds that are willing to hear about God. Do I agree with everything about Kanye? No. But when God provides an Elijah, I feel like we should be like Obadiah, those who have been less able we should somehow pray for them. We should somehow encourage them. We should somehow recognize that they are getting a voice when so many have failed and so many have been silenced and so many have been shut down. We need to realize that that's unusual, that Elijahs are hard to come by. And when they are out there, even if we're not 100% in sync with them, we should support them because those who are for us, right, are not against us, as Jesus put it. Elijahs are few, and we need to pray for God to raise up Elijahs. And when they do pop up and they find traction and they find a voice in our culture, we should run with it. We should support it. We should allow them to get as much of a voice as they can get. Because no one's perfect. Elijah fights back, as you saw in verse 18. I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. But you and your father's family have, and you have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. And this is his plan. This is Elijah's plan. Three and a half years of drought. And now the next stage, he says, now summon Summon the people from all over Israel to meet on Mount Carmel. That's next week. Huge event. I want you to gather the nation on the Mount. Now, I don't know how many people are in the land right now, how many people are in the nation of Israel, but my guess it's about a million people. And a lot of them, their jobs are gone. Their businesses are, are just in, in disarray. The farms are kaput. I mean, it's just, it's a mess. Three and a half years. So they're probably free. They could probably handle a trip to Mount Carmel, especially if it means the end of the drought. And he says, now summon the people from all over Israel to meet on Mount Carmel. And also bring those 450 prophets of Baal and those 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's tables, those 850 prophets she supports, bring them as well. Now think about this. What is Elijah up to? This is about being smart. This is about changing a culture. As we read this story, we will see that Elijah hopes Ahab will come around. But that's not his ultimate target. He doesn't have any hope in Jezebel from what I can tell. But he kind of hopes Ahab will see the light because he's a Jew and eventually maybe he'll see the light and come home. But he doesn't. Who Elijah is focused on is not the entrenched opposition. Who does he invite to Mount Carmel? The people. The masses. This is huge for us. There are really just four groups there's this entrenched opposition. There's this silent believers. Hopefully there's a silent majority in America. There are these Elijahs, those who get traction and has a voice. But then there's this mass, this mass of people that through history gets pulled in the conflict. Pulled in the religious conflict that takes place in our world. You have the world pulling it one way and you have God pulling it 
another way with his faithful doing the work. And as the people go, so the culture shifts. For the last 40 years, the masses have been drifting away from God, being pulled by this entrenched opposition. They're being pulled from God, slowly but surely. And now when surveyed, we have what we call the rise of the nuns. So when people are surveyed about a religious affiliation, they now, by huge numbers, say none. I have no religious affiliation. 40 years ago, they would have said they were Christian, would have affirmed Christian ideas. Over 40 years, there's been this pull of the world away, pulling those masses And wherever the masses go, that's where the culture goes. So who's Elijah focusing on? The masses, the people, the heart of the people. And he's trying to pull them back. And next week, you're going to see the event. But he's already given them three and a half years of a flood to get their attention, to realize you're going the wrong way. You're pursuing a God who doesn't even exist, a God with no superpower, a God who can't send rain, and yet you worship him for the rain. Wake up, smell the coffee, come home to the real God. The masses are where it at. Whoever gets the heart of the masses sways culture. That's just how it's worked. That's the way it's always worked. Back in Rome, about 400 AD, Christianity has really gotten a foothold. And it's actually become one of the national religions in Rome. There was this monk, and his name was Telemachus. He lived in Turkey. We called it Asia at the time, but he lived in what we call modern-day Turkey. And he came to Rome just to, I guess, on tourism or business. I don't know why he was there. And while he was there, he went to one of the spectacles. What is a spectacle? That's what they called the gladiatorial games. So Telemachus is up there in the Colosseum, you know, the big oval dirt with the, with the walls up and then the seats, the layered seats going up so the crowd can come and watch the gladiators fight to the death. And he's there and he's absolutely horrified. His Christian faith and his Christian ideals are like, hold it. This should not be be happening and he rushed for it he got out of his seat he rushed down to the wall that overlooked the dirt below and he yelled as loud as he as he could he said in the name of Christ stop and nobody listened so he jumped over the wall jumped those 10 12 feet down to the dirt and he rushed onto the field and again in the name of Christ stop now people are starting to notice He rushes out to the gladiators that are in the midst of their fighting and he puts himself right in between them and stops the fight and again yells, in the name of Christ, stop. And finally, the gladiators stop. And the audience is silenced as they watch this and wonder, what is this guy doing? Everybody's uncomfortable. Everybody's awkward. What's going on? The gladiators try to pull away. They try to separate themselves from Telemachus so they can get back to doing what they're supposed to be doing. But wherever they move, he moves. And he kept saying, in the name of Christ, stop. And finally, the gladiators don't know what to do. They just stop. Well, that's when the crowd starts getting into it. And they're angry. They're furious because Telemachus has the nerve to insert themselves in their pleasure. The pursuit of their sin. And they can't have that. So they start jeering him and and calling at him and just asking the gladiators to kill him and just get rid of this guy. But nobody's going to do anything. Everybody's kind of stuck and they don't respond at all. So the crowd starts getting up from their seats and they start getting over the wall and onto the floor and they start picking up rocks. And right there on the spot, the crowd the masses stone Telemachus to death. And they say that this eerie silence fell over the Colosseum. And the crowd that stoned Telemachus kind of hangs their head and leaves in silence. And the culture, the people start talking about the evils of the game. This blood, why are we doing this? Why are we glorifying death? Why are we killing each other? This is, we're supposed to be now Christian nation. And the uproar, 
that came from Telemachus' death was huge. And in three days, the emperor called off all games in Rome. Why? Because it really wasn't about the emperor. It was about the heart of the masses. And where the culture goes will be determined by the masses of people that are swayed. We've got to be smart about this. This whole study of Elijah and Elisha is this tool to help us be smart as believers so that we have a better chance of success out in the culture. We've got to learn to tell our story, to capture our heart. We need to learn to do things in such a way that we get the heart of the people. The culture on the other side is trying to do the same thing. They're trying to capture our heart. George Floyd gave them that as part of the push. And then now we have looting and we have robbing and we have violence every night. And it's all this force, this push to pull us away from our Christian culture and towards socialism or some other form like that. We need to get back to biblical Christianity. We need to get back to real faith. We need to get back to Christ. And we need to figure out a way to be a voice out there. Even if we're in that silent believer category, we need to figure out a way to be like Obadiah and still be a force out there. And then we need to find Elijah's to speak up. Because life, life, it comes down to life. People's life matters. People, we want to see them get to heaven. We want them to be saved, right? But it's more than that. We want to see them have a quality of life that God can only give them. We want a quality of culture that is truly Christian so we can have peace and we can have joy and we can have harmony. We can have true equality. We can have justice. It'll never be perfect because we're not perfect. But the closest we will get to the culture we need is with Christ. But in order to do that, we need to be smart and realize that it is a battle. And whether we like it or not, we are the ones living in this day and age. And somehow, we got to figure out how to get a voice and change the culture by capturing the heart of the people again. Imagine what it would be like if we could finally, finally be heard finally get that voice, finally be able to proclaim Christ in all of his glory and wonder and in his love and in his kindness and everything that goes with him. Because Christ brings a culture with him and it's a good one and it's one where everyone thrives and flourishes. Let's pray. Lord, we do praise you. We do praise you that you are a great and glorious God who loves us. And Lord, you offer the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, one of the things we as Christians aren't so sure of anymore is that you are the way, the truth, and the life. That our culture would actually be better led by you than led by the world. Help us to recapture a vision for what culture can be. To, to, to regain a vision of our forefathers for, for truth and liberty, for the pursuit of happiness, and, and this Christian culture that could foster what we're really looking for. Help us as believers to again truly believe that people are better with God than without God. And that our culture is better with God than without God. And that God offers the way, the truth, and the life. And help us as your people, Lord, to be salt and light as you called us to be. To be out there and make disciples. To, to be a force for good, to be voices of truth, to be Elijah's when it's called for, and to be those silent believers that are still moving in the culture if that's all we have left. Help us to realize that there is a battle and help us to realize the culture is really in our hands to shape and mold and be a part of. And Lord, we just ask that you would guide us and direct us, that you would move in us and you would give us wisdom to know how it all works so that we can be wise 
as we post and wise as we share our story. So we can be wise as we proclaim Jesus. Help us to be wise and Lord, we ask that you would capture the whole heart of the culture and you would use us as your voice in the midst of it. And Lord, you would revive our land. You would renew our land. We pray for revival. We pray for awakening. We pray for this movement of God. Lord, do something great like you've done in the past. Send Elijah and lead us back home. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen.